welcome uh, to everybody uh, for this week's round table. My name's Sam Mickelson. I'm director for ERG. We are a tech recruitment company and consultancy business. We help organizations to grow and build technical teams and we help them overcome strategic business or digital transformation challenges. We do this by working with only the very best technical people. Some of us, uh, some, all are on the call today. Uh, they're C-level subject matter experts and our unique collaborative circle uh, network is where our partners come together to network and collaborate and access insight like this uh, roundtable event. We are 100% committed to hosting these inclusive events and talks where anyone is welcome and everyone has a voice. Uh, this event and previous events are recorded and then hosted on our YouTube channel where you can watch these sessions back. Where we have presentations, the slide decks are also available to view. Um, for now, please mute yourself um, to avoid any background noises that might interfere with our speakers. But please do feel free to ask any questions throughout the event and I will try my best to introduce you at the right time. You can raise your hand using the Zoom feature and the interface. Um, we do have a poll running, but today we don't have any questions because we're, we're still getting used to that, that new feature. So I'm gonna um, introduce our uh, presenters or our panelists today. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce Nigel Lemon. Um, Nigel uh, has works at you know quite opposite ends of the domain spectrum so he's ex british american tobacco but also he's ex nando's uh two very very different organizations um his roles have included uh non-exec director executive director managing director chief information officer and strategy director um, this is included or included living and working in three different continents. He's also uh, provided leadership roles in mergers and acquisitions from initial due diligence right the way through to delivery uh, of integration synergies. Um, Nigel has adapted a range of industry sectors, uh, including FMCG, utilities, manufacturing, B2B shared services uh, and private and public sector and enhanced by a full-time MBA from one of Europe's leading business schools. So welcome, Nigel. Thank you, Sam. Wow, what an introduction. There, there, there you go, there's, there, there's, there's Nigel. Um, we also have Jonathan Mortlock. Hello, Jonathan, thank you for, for being here. Um, Jonathan is a senior, ex a senior executive, extensive global IT leadership experience in quite diverse industries. So chemical, FMCG, manufacturing, um, and you've also um, have a financial and management accounting background. So with that, you've uh, focused on delivering critical business systems recently. Um, you've had oversight of IT security strategy, defining the IT program governance structure and coordinating a merger and acquisition. Um, as well as managing key vendor relationships around SAP, Microsoft and Freudenberg IT Syntax. So welcome, Jonathan. Good evening. Thank you, Sam. Um, and then I've got Andy Brookhausen. Andy, hello. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Good. Um, Andy is, uh, well, w w we've called you. Uh, we've, we've given you a job title, Andy. You are uh, an outsourced IT outsourcing consultant, uh, but you've been, you know, your career is uh, system engineering, operations, uh, software development, maintenance and operation. Um, you believe that technology change by itself doesn't do this alone, but provides the agility that a modern business requires. Um, it's not just about the IT, is it? It's about the people for you, Andy. Yeah, it's very much about the organisation, um, which needs to change in line with the IT, yeah, with the technology. So welcome, Andy. Really, um, we've got so, so thank you. Um, when we were sending out the um, invites to people, uh, I had a few emails back from people saying, yeah, great video, but I don't know who these guys are. 
um, and you should have said who you're working for. So I had to try and politely explain in my email to this chap that uh, we couldn't get everything into one two minute video or 30 second video. Uh, but, but rest assured that, um, you know, Jonathan, Nigel and Andy have uh, a wealth of experience. And what's quite interesting is that it's really quite diverse. We're going to be covering a few different subjects uh, this evening. We're going to be looking at business agility, mergers and acquisitions, turnaround scenarios. And in between, we're going to look at things like security and how we can learn from data. But the main drive of this was around the challenges that a CIO might face when it comes to spend and investment in technology versus cost savings. And, um, you know, how maybe a CFO might drive certain things versus how a CAO might behave and drive certain things. So I'm going to kick off um, with Nigel. Um, Nigel, I think your background and your experience um, lends itself to a lot of business agility, mergers and acquisitions, but also around turnaround scenarios. So you currently work for um, a, a, a consultancy organization and they call on you for fractional advice. Do you want to just give us a bit of an idea of, you know, what, what your sort of background is and what you're doing at the moment? Give us some examples of where you've been brought in to, to help organisations. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Sam. Um, well, I guess, you know, my background, as you said in the intro, is um, across a number of organisations and sectors. I guess I've uh, been in technology roles at business unit level, regional level and at global level. Uh, and also had some PL roles. But uh, more recently, uh, working with the global strategic uh, consultancy that I am, I'm, I'm being brought in really to help help uh, them engage clients with, with people who, uh, in the client's eyes, have, I guess, have been there and done it a bit and are, are more practitioners than perhaps they, uh, the consultants might be perceived otherwise. So that's been everything from helping client engagement and, and bringing, uh, you know, winning business for the consultancy uh, and also working with a number of uh, digital platforms that were emerging, um, helping them understand how enterprise, larger enterprises buy technology, how they architect themselves and the kind of challenges of um, engaging the decision makers in order to buy different kinds of SaaS platforms and, and, and some of the, uh, the sort of emerging technologies that are, that are coming out of, you know, particularly uh, the US and, and, and the West Coast. So um, uh, quite, a, quite a wide variety of stuff at the minute. And, and Nigel, what, when, you, when, you, when you go into an organisation and um, there is that appetite to now go on some kind of digital transformation journey, so there's going to be some investment there, what, what do you find are the a, a major challenges when it comes to engaging stakeholders for the first time? I think some of the the early challenges are off, often are are obviously as uh, as we kind of alluded to there with Andy is 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 how the organisation is uh, organised with, with regard to technology, how it's ex what its experience has been, and the relationship between the the you know the digital function, the technology function, whatever we want to call it these days, uh, and the existing business. In some cases, you know that's moved. And, and, and maybe uh, what we'd all aspire to for the 21st century in that it's, you know, it, it, it's moved into a more flexible, cross-functional working. They're, they're getting into much more a DevOps kind of way of working and thinking about things, at least in that way, or at least starting to move that way. Whereas others are still very much in what I would class a kind of 20th century mode where the technology function is, is seen as an enabler, not really part of the business on a day-to-day -day basis, and is invited in, you know, in, in a more transactional sense. And, and you know, organisations um, have some very different starting points, but, but many of them, you know, get the buzzword digital transformation and, and want to embark immediately uh, uh, on, on that transformation without perhaps thinking and understanding where they are currently first. I, th I think that's a really good point. And I know that Andy in particular has a real passion for this 
um, you know, when somebody talks about digital transformation, it's, oh, well, you know, technology is going to fix the problem. And that's not always the case. And I'd, I'd, I'd like to come back to that and circle back to that with, with Andy in particular. Um, for you, Nigel, I know that, that um, when it comes to coming into a business that's in a turnaround situation, I guess there's a real challenge there that usually um, money and finances is a big moot point. So the CFO on the one hand is saying, you know, actually we, we can't afford to invest, but the CEO knows that they need to drive things forward. How, how, how have you seen that happen in the past yourself? Well, yeah, I, and, and you're absolutely right. You know, often organizations, uh, you know, are successful to a point um, and, and don't always make the investments on the journey while they are successful uh, and, and often reach a crisis point or something changes within their business environment that, that you know, causes that as, as currently the environment we're in. Um, and then they're trying to make a big change when actually funding and balance sheets and profitability, you know, are, are, are less able to, um, to step in and, and, and support that change. And I think you set it up on, on LinkedIn when, you know, that famous, you know, quote of, of you know, a, a CFO and a CEO talking about, you know, something the HR directors um, suggested that, you know, we spend a lot of money on training and the CFO says, what happens if we spend all this money and, and all these people leave? And the CEO turns around and says, well, what happens if they, we don't train them and they stay? <laughs> and in some respects, technology is very similar. Um, you know, yes, there is, um, and I think traditionally a challenge of where IT has been perceived and, and, and much of it has been uh, dedicated to existing run costs. The investment over the past five years is now there. It's being amortized, but it's being run as, as the legacy estate. And, and that's often where a lot of the expenditure has been. And, and, you know, when you then get into transformation and you want to inject a whole, lot, a whole lot of change into the portfolio, you've still got a lot of this cost. And, and, and then you've got the challenge of, at times, you know, it may well be that if you want to migrate to the cloud, you want to start making some change, you've got double run costs. Um, and the CFO may look at the on-premise environment, highly, you know, pretty well amortized. On paper, it may actually look relatively cheap to run then you start to say, you know, we need all this investment. This is going to be out of OPEX. It's not going to be out of capital. We need to make this change. You know, there's a real tension there between um, finding the funding at a moment in crisis to transform, committing to revenue and, and, and the business case for that transformation, whilst also seeing that, that in fact, you, you've still got a lot of legacy, a lot of technical debt that actually isn't going to go away overnight. Um, and, and that's quite a difficult place to navigate, and, and, and it requires it, it requires a good understanding by the entire executive of what you're trying to achieve and support from all. Um, and it's really important that that transformation isn't positioned entirely as a, as a technology investment, a technology spend, and, and it's all about that side of the house. It's got to be dedicated in business outcomes. But but that is a, a, a very difficult place for any uh, technology executive to. Uh, to, to gain support and, and, and get momentum behind a transformation. Yeah, that must be a, a, a massive challenge, really. Um, Jonathan, um, I, you know, your experience is, is kind of very, very different to that. Obviously, when it comes to a, a merger and acquisition, which you've been, you know, heavily involved with recently, um, your challenge has been um, making sure that the organisation that's coming in to acquire you know, yourself in the UK, um, you, 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 you hand over a, a business, an IT system that is not just fit for purpose, but is what they thought they were going to buy. So what, what's, the, what's the challenge for you or what, what have you found has been the big challenge over the last six to 12 months in your world particularly? Yeah, yeah I mean, the, the businesses that I've worked at over the last five well for the last 20 years nearly but certainly over the last five or six years you know we've been heavily in the first period of that heavily um uh, going through various business unit carve outs and, and divestment uh, and then the business that i'm at now has actually flipped ownership um four times in the last five years so actually trying to get um the uh, and one of those owners owned it for three years of that five-year period 
Um, so trying to get the investment to do some of these transformational activities over that period of time, particularly in, in two of the owners' cases where it was PE-based, has been a challenge because from a, you know, we've had this situ situation where your CEO has been focused on, on um, building the value of the business, looking at a relatively medium term uh, outlook to, to drive that value, looking to the next sale within the PE environment. And the, um, you know, versus the CFO argument, like you say, not really wanting to invest too much equally and, and trying to find that balancing act between adding value to the organization in a relatively short period of time um, within that kind of ownership timeline, uh, but also not investing too much cash in the process. And it's been a challenge. Um, and, and particularly uh, the last 12 months, um, as we went through the last sale process, um, that, uh, that, that, that concluded at the beginning of this year, uh, moving from uh, two PE owners into a strategic, strategic ownership uh, has uh, been a very, you know, a very different um, animal again uh, compared to what we've been through over the last five, six years. But um, moving into a, into a phase of ownership where now we are, what, we are a significant junior partner in, in the overall business, you know, um, one twentieth of the size of revenue, you know, looking at, compared to the rest of the business, just as one metric. So trying to, you know, trying to drive transformation has been a, a challenge over over that, that that multiple change in ownership over that relatively short period of time. Um, but you know, we've we've been able to do various things successfully over that period and and add value significantly through IT. So much so that in the last in the last sale. Um, you know, the, the, the fact that the, the platform that we had implemented over the prior three years was actually a significant, uh, a significant value add to the overall, overall deal when you look at it in its entirety. That's interesting. And, it, and it's, it's a very, very different uh, challenge to what Nigel, mm. you know, faced. And so, Andy, um, you know, from a consultancy point of view, when you work for someone like HPE or DXC and you're there as the, you know, the incumbent supplier, um, I'm, I'm guessing you're also under a lot of pressure from whether it be the CIO, the CTO, the, the CEO and the CFO to, you know, drive down costs, you know, go, go and speak to the suppliers and renegotiate, you know, that'll solve all our problems. And I, 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 I'm guessing that's, on a lot of people's agenda right now. Yeah, I think that one of the experiences we had is that, you know, uh, most people's costs of operations is too expensive compared to their value that they're investing into, um, investing into business change and hence the digital transformation, whatever digital transformation means. And they try to salami slice the costs of operations by trying to drive down the supplier to, to basically just reduce those operational costs and that, that's what they're dri driving along. And, and the problem with that is that what happens then is those people, you know, they put more and more automation into operations and, but only for the benefit of the supplier, not really for the benefit of the, um, of the, custom, the end customer. We, we worked with a lot of organizations who were moving, who were doing the apps migration to cloud, so to speak, but for, you know, had no real measure of what the outcomes they were trying to achieve was were they trying to achieve cost savings in terms of their IT infrastructure, or actually were they really trying to gain the ability to release change quicker? You know, you're going from one change per quarter to you know two, three hundred changes per month in, in some positions. And, and and that was where the balance we we struggled with a lot of the time is that we were told in one hand to reduce costs. But in the other hand, you know, and to maintain the SLAs, but in the other hand was actually to, to reduce the risk of deploying things into that live environment. And then subsequently, they'd also develop, you know, new functions in the cloud and throw those over to a very heritage style operational capability. You don't really know how to manage an environment which is changing on a daily, hourly basis if, if people have got all the tool sets and things in, in place. So, so and, and then, you know, they would talk a lot about, oh, we want agile teams, we want DevOps, etc. 
but they then also only change that at the very base level. They wouldn't implement the changes around the governance and the portfolio level organizational changes which need to take place. So in effect, most of the projects that they implemented never ever really released the benefits in terms of cash benefits that the CFO was expecting. And so immediately there's that tension between the CFO and the CIO um, in the conversations we have. And we used to get them into, in, into these collaborative workshops, which we used to do. And, and the main battle we had was actually stopping them arguing in the middle of, uh, in, in the, middle of the meetings because they, they would just were not aligned. And if you threw a business person into it, it then, you know, then you just have a three-way argument coming through it. And it was because the organization and the outcomes those people wanted weren't aligned. You know, the CFO wanted reduced costs. The head of operations wanted, you know, was paid on the lack of, you know, on the availability of systems. And the business wanted high level of change and actually didn't really care if there was a little bit of an availability problem. You know, they, want, they wanted new features going in, in, in and things like that. And it's those, it's those things that we were challenged with um, as a supplier, but also then when I was advising people to move into a much more agile operational uh, organizational constructs, the, the conversations we had with those organizations. I mean, the prime example is we, we implemented an agile delivery factory for software development of a web service for, for a large telco. Um, but they, and we, we were releasing changes every, every week in that sense, every, uh, each of the sprints. But the governance at the front and the back end didn't change, including the release management stuff. So release changes were still taking 52 days to get in from a customer, from the, from the business wanting a change to get the change in. And yet the part they've outsourced and given to, um, to ourselves as the Agile Delivery Factory, we're actually doing it within weeks. You know, with it, with it, within one or two um, days and things like that, because they hadn't thought about the end-to-end -end process and the end-to-end -end organization that needed to change alongside the introduction of things like the data analytics, the cloud, you know, the, it, it, and all the new modern technology that people were trying to get in. Particularly, the business had been sold had been sold by going to see what Microsoft and Amazon were doing in the cloud. So that's where, where the organizational construct, I think, really needs to play a part. Otherwise, the, a lot of the projects end up being black swans, really. Yeah. And, and that must be, you know, is that why consultancies get a bad name? Yeah, and it's half the time it's not really your fault. It's about a culture alignment. It's, you know, egos on the, in the boardroom, as it were. Yeah, we, I mean, we talked, I mean, a lot of the time, really, you know, we, in, the, in the organization I worked in, DXC, you know, we talked about the watermelon, you know, um, we, it's, uh, every, all the SLAs were, were green, but you cut inside it and it was all completely bright red. The business hated the service, the, you know, the CFO thought it was too expensive, the CIO didn't think we were putting enough innovation in, and yeah, every single measure that we were contracted and, and, and required to do were green. So, so the contract wasn't, wasn't constructed to that. And, and that, that's the watermelon. I think that, that most, org, most outsourcing organizations get stuck with and tarred with. Yes, you know, we have, they have their own problems, but that is part of, part of the issue is that you contracted on a transactional set of IT SLAs, et cetera, and things like that, which are not aligned to the stakeholders that you're dealing with, the CFO, the CIO, and the business leaders. So, um, okay, so we, we, we've heard a few challenges. Um, what, 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 what are the answers then, Nigel? You know, how, how do organisations, you know, where are they best to start when it comes to, well, I'm going to say it, so you can get your, your, your sort of bingo cards out, COVID. Um, obviously, you know, we can't get away from that. That's, that's massively going to change companies in every way. What, 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 what do companies need to do then for, you know, the next six months, the next 12 months? Where do they need to focus their investment when it comes to digital transformation? Well, to be honest, I, th I think the short answer is that's going to vary enormously depending on um, the degree of impact that the pandemic's had on them. Um, and uh, uh, if you like, the, the key priorities that, that they've got at the minute, um, uh, you know, I... I wrote a, a 
jointly wrote a white paper on on this uh, back at the start of the pandemic and and you know if you take a simple two by two of um you know revenue up or down costs up or down and and look at some of the different businesses some of the sectors you, you see very marked uh, impacts of the pandemic you know there are those that have uh, uh, actually thrived and there are those that that really are struggling and i think that's that's apparent to everybody but i mean i think you know so so i don't think there's an easy answer to that question in terms of where you start other than the fact that ultimately you've got to start with um uh, you're either on business strategy or you're surviving and i think that's the first debate to be had are we you know is, is, are we impacted to a degree that means we can still stick to the strategy still focus on those things we were focusing on before whilst riding out this rough period or actually guys you know, are we in some kind of survival mode now? We just need to work out how to operate within this new reality. Um, and, and I think, you know, that's, that's probably any business right now has probably already been through that um, and, and, and hopefully made some plans and, and made some changes about that. I mean, if you take the pandemic situation aside, I think, you know, just coming back to digital transformation um, as a starting point, if you like, um, I, I think the first thing is, is to not use the phrase digital transformation um, and, and work out what is the business change you want to create and, and perhaps start with, you know, what's the current customer journey that your customers have and, and what, what would they like it to look like and how can, how can we take friction out of our, our customer journey um, and, and, and change the way in which uh, customers engage with us, uh, relate to us and, and, and their experience of us. And, and I think, you know, you've got to go, I think the whole point of, of what people kind of, I think what they mean by digital transformation, or, or, or certainly in my experience, is, is, is you need to take yourself outside the organization, look back in, rather than doing it from inside the organization, as, we, you know, we've traditionally done incremental kind of uh, investment and change. I'll yeah. stop there, because otherwise I'll, I'll get on a soapbox. <laughs> No, that's all right. Um, I, I hear all the time, it's not about technology, it's about the people. Um, if, you, if you want to, you know, wh whatever the, the, the project is, whether it is cloud uh, architecture, whether it's data analytics, whether it's a new e-commerce or ERP solution, you know, if you, if you don't get the, the people uh, in the business engaged, then, you, you know, you, you've, you've failed right at the start. So, what, Andy, Andy, what's your experience been when it when it comes to engaging with the business and people? Where, where do you start? So I think I think I think one of the challenges that a lot of outsourcing companies have got is that that they're outsourced to the IT department. They're not outsourced to the business. So very few of the outsourcing organisations, outsourcing contracts, allows you actually to have a proper discussion with the business, and um, you almost kept at arm's length from that. I, I, I think though, I completely agree, you know, what is digital transformation? It, 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 you know, it's stuff, people think digital transformation and they immediately think, oh, we're gonna transform everything to cloud, you know, and, uh, you know, which, and then they set up all these projects to do these things. I think we, we, we've, we really started driving to, to get people to think much more about continuous transformation as opposed to digital transformation. And almost, we almost try to banish the word projects because projects in their own right, have, which have got start and end points, are, 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 are part of the problem because they, they, can't, they can't change. And I'll use the dreaded pivot word, a project can't pivot. Yeah, if, if that project is absolutely locked down, is, you know, et cetera. Whereas if you are driving things in a much more agile, you know, uh, uh, you know and I hate to use the word agile, but more agile way, then you know something like a COVID comes along, you, you can easily change that investment of where you're trying to get to. The problem that's happened is that the investments are released by a lot of the boards to do a very specific thing. And if you don't deliver that very specific thing, even if it was, even if it's now the wrong thing, the board still expects that thing to be delivered. And yet that thing which is to be delivered, you know, might have been the right thing in February, you know. But actually, in the middle of March, would not have been the right thing to, to, to deliver. And there was no, there's almost no way of stopping these juggernauts, um, you know, going forward. We used to use the terminology, you've got a super tanker, which is the old style transformation projects, or you have a load of speedboats, which is the digital transformation manner. Those speedboats 
need to know where they're going. Are they all going to, you know, Nice or they're going to, you know, you don't want to spread across the world. They've got to have the strategy of where they're trying to get to. But keep those as speedboats. Don't set a big juggernaut or a big super tanker on its journey, right? Because you'll never change it. And I think that's where a lot of the problems are. And it comes down to the type of relationship that you have with, with your outsourcer. Um, I think most of those are very transactional, SLA based, et cetera, or that point in time. You know, if you have an outsourcer who delivers you a project, at the end of that project, all the people involved in that project go off to another project. You know, they're not, they're not staying around to help deliver and help to, to optimize what, what they've delivered. Whereas, and then the other thing is you move to a different type of contracting, which is really when you start getting into relationship contracting and even partnership invested contracting which actually makes the enterprise just become an, a, a holistic ecosystem of, of suppliers and partners, as opposed to an us and them style environment. We were very lucky to get in, if we got, if we got tr access to true business people, we actually felt we were lucky as, a, as an outsourcer. And I, I guess that's, that's the key, isn't it? It's relationships, it's managing expectations. Um, when you talk about projects and saying, don't call them projects, um, again, something I've, I've heard from a number of people is that, you know, actually, you, if you call them products, you get, you know, you create a product within the business, people kind of buy into that a, a lot more. And, and maybe it's just a psychological thing. But again, it comes back to people buying into it, getting on board, and then, and then seeing things through. Um, you, 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 the problem, the, the slight problem you have as well, though, is then you get people who are, um, who have read the methodology books, and they've just eaten those books for breakfast. So they say, well, you can't have a, if you're going to have a product, you need to have a product manager, product owner. There can only be one, there can be two, you've got to do it this way, you've got to do it that way. Whereas actually, you know, because so, they've read the manual, as opposed yeah. to saying, well, actually, let's just take the concepts of what we're trying to deliver. Yeah, <laughs> you know? and, and tomorrow we're all going to be a scrum master instead. <laughs> so, so, and we're going to do it all in an agile fashion. I, I spoke to uh, one of the chaps who's- That was only last year though, Sam. It, it is very much last year. Well, funny enough, the guy who mentioned that to me, he said, it's a guy called Stuart College, and um, he's going to be on one of our round tables in a few weeks. And he said, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, he said, I'm, I, he was working for an organisation. I won't say who it was. He said, I'm sat there. And uh, the, 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 the director said, yeah, so we're going to be more agile. Uh, tomorrow, uh, we're all going to be scrum masters. And the next week he, he resigned and, and, and left. So yeah, it, it goes on, doesn't it? Um, for, for you then, Jonathan, um, you know, what, 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 what was your biggest challenge in the last 12 months for you? Because I know that you worked a lot in the um, implementation of, of SAP, but mm -hmm. again, you know, the, something that's been around for years and years and years. How's, how's that been for you then? Well, to be honest, it's probably less an SAP issue because of where we were at. But the biggest challenge over the last 12 months, and in particular, um, the last six to eight, has really been trying to get to grips with, uh, with, with, um, the, new own with the new owners um, remotely. You know, we, we were bought on like the 28th, 28th, 29th of January, the deal closed. Six weeks later, all travels banned, you know. Uh, and we've not had any... Um, face-to-face -face IT meetings, for, as an example, with, with our new, um, with our new um, colleagues out of a significantly larger IT organization to discuss it, you know, the integration. So all of that activity has gone on remotely um, through, through uh, you know, through these challenging times. And, and it's been, it's been a, um, a significant shift in the way we would have done it, but we've kind of got there, I think. Uh, getting there it's going to be a longer long road and it's going to be a longer integration than we than we planned at the beginning you know unless we can get people face to face pretty soon um but we're slowly getting there but it did take a uh it did take a, a quite a period of time through through march and april um as the new you know the new regulations and that settled in for us to try and figure out how we were going to work uh, through through these you know these critical first months under new ownership, not just in IT but across all, all areas of the business really, um, you know singularly badly timed overall for you know for everyone.
everybody, but you know, of course. But you know, within within the context of our business, um, you know, it's been a, it's been a challenge, um, an additional challenge with those in, integration things that just couldn't happen as normal. Um, you know, we were only this weekend, as an example, getting all the email migration happened, and that would normally have been done months ago. Um, you know, so it's it's been a uh, it's been difficult for sure. Uh, I've not I've difficult? not seen my I've not seen my team since the beginning of March. So, and how much of a delay do you think that that's had on 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 getting things over the line? How quickly would you have done it normally to compare to now? Yeah, I think I think given the I think there's a, there's a difference there between the, the the speed that I would have done it on the, in their shoes and the speed that they're doing it in their shoes. Um, I think you know it. it if I was if I was leading the project from their side, I'd say that they're they're six to twelve months behind where I would have thought they would be when 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 they first came in the door in January and what we expected to happen and when we expected it to happen, I'd say we're easily six to twelve months behind. Um, and part of that is because of the the, the impact of, of some other critical projects that are precursors to uh, our SAP migration, for example. Um, they're, they're going through a big S4 upgrade, which is live in, in January. So there's some of those dependencies that are kicking in. But, um, you know, I'd, I'd say you know, overall six to 12 months behind by the end of this, uh, conservatively. Now, I'm going to... And, and then, you know, and when we, one of the projects we've done in the interim is evaluate, uh, do a detailed dive on what, what the synergies will be once all of those things are done. And, you know, they're in the relatively significant order of magnitude uh, and certainly orders of magnitude uh, above what they put in their plan. So, that, so those delays will have an impact on their ability to achieve those uh, organi integration synergies on the back of the deal, for sure. Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to pick on you again for this, Jonathan, because I'm going to talk, I'm going I'm to pick on a, a technical area. I'm going to talk about data and, and learning mm -hmm. from data. Um, I know that your experience is quite data driven, isn't it? Mm. So what, how's, how's that work? How's data helped you in, in, in the last six to 12 months? Yeah. So, uh, I, I, uh, when, when we carved out this business three and a half years ago, I, I seem to end up uh, leading an analytics implementation project for the first time within, within the context of the carve out, I took specific responsibility for building out our, our new analytics platform across the business and other people on the team did other parts of the transformation and carve back. And I've never done, you know, never done that kind of analytic um, side of things uh, previously, even though we had those tools, it just wasn't an area that I'd been focused on. So there was an interesting rapid implementation journey in 2017 uh, that, that I've had opportunity to speak on uh, a number of places uh, um, previously about how we, we did that uh, over three or four, you know, implemented a, a new analytics platform in three to four weeks for the business. But specifically over the last um, six to 12 months, the, the, the accessibility of data to enable us to uh, provide the answers to the, the, to not just to the business um, through the sale process, but also to those bidding within, within the sales process, wanting the, the information available within the data room and so forth, that rapid turnaround through a relatively quick sale. Um, you know, having the, having the access, to, the easy access to that data and knowing how, how it was structured and how to, how to build it out was key to our being able to, uh, to rapidly fulfill the, the request through, the, through that sale, in, through the sale deal in, in particular. Uh, equally through, you know, again, through the integrate, through the early stages of the integration, being able to, uh, and, um, you know, to be quite frank, our analytics platform is, is um, three to four years ahead of our new owners, um, which I think they would acknowledge themselves, you know, being able to demonstrate our, our ability to uh, access the, the kind of data we can in, in near real time, um, you know, with the, the quality of data has been something that's really been an eye opener uh, to, to our, our new, new owners um, and a positive eye opener as well. And, and then them seeing, uh, seeing how that path forward for them as part of their, uh, part of their analytics um, reinvention over the next couple of years is going to play out too. So it's, been, it's certainly been something that, that we've been able to, to lean on heavily over this last period, for sure, in any number of different ways. 
That's really interesting. And um, I, I, I want to bring in Andy Flack. Andy, you're my go-to guy here to bring into the conversation. Um, so you've heard from Nigel, you've heard from Jonathan, and you've heard from Andy about some of the challenges they faced. Does any, you know, for you, ex-CTO of World Stores, and then you were acquired by Dunelm, you know, big retailer. Does any of the, the, the sort of stories, the, 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 the sort of things that you've heard, the anecdotes, does that ring true with yourself as well? Uh, very much so. Um, the, the latter experience when we were um, bought by Dunnell, we were probably one-tenth their size. Um, we were pure play web. They were primarily store-based. It was a interesting exercise in clicks meets bricks. Um, and the, uh, the tempo of work, um, you know, Jonathan, you, you said about uh, if you'd been running it, how long it would take for you to have done the integration where you'd expect to be. Um, I had the same sort of um, rescheduling of uh, events, shall we say, when um, things were gonna go. Um, <laughs> And yeah, I, I totally can hear where you're coming from there. The bit that you're talking about with regards to um, actual um, business buy-in, I, I, I do have a difficulty with associating to that because coming from the uh, pure play um, world stores environment, where in fact you could say that the business was an extension of IT rather mm -hmm. than IT was something that serviced parts of the business because it was a it was all websites. We were running what 105 odd websites, yeah, 87 simultaneous websites. We've got a million products, 500 plus suppliers, and things like that. So you know, it was quite a complex environment. But the business were actually um, almost subcontracted processes from IT to do things. And so the, the, um, the alignment there was much easier because it was, it was all, yeah, we are one team here, guys. We are one thing. We are trying to get one objective. How do we do it? Well, you do that bit. I do this bit. You do that bit, right? We all meet together. Um, what budget are we going to do it in? Well, you're not going to have one of those. It's going to be as little as possible, um, that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, I, I do have a bit of difficulty in actually associating to what some Andy was saying about the um, the being separated from the business in that respect. I do, however, recognise it from my later experience, right? Where suddenly coming into an environment where um, the uh, purchasing company is in Leicester, where the the purchase company is based in London, so you've automatically got a, a physical um, split between the two where the um virtually the entirety of the board sits up in um in leicester except when they want to come down and use the boardroom in london when they come down for the day and use that um so there's the difference there with regards to actually suddenly finding yourself divorced from the business and coming at it from the other direction to what you were talking about um, rather than suddenly you know trying to get in you're suddenly finding yourself on the outside going hang on i used to talk to these people and just go over and say let's do this let's get this done what was your problem let's sort it out and now it's a hang on who do i actually have to speak to who's actually doing this where does it come from you know who who really gives a whatever about whether this works or not so you know the, the just the scale of the organization changing probably was the was the major element there but i don't know if that helps you in your um there, so. Just, just coming in from that, Andrew, is that uh, absolutely is that one of the reasons why a lot of the initial outsourcing deals, you know, really struggle is because you, you you're taking that sort of environment from a company where the business person could go and tap Steve on the shoulder and just say, "I need this," yeah. to suddenly having a contractual body of an outsource in place, which means that that person can't be tapped. And actually, Steve is no longer Steve. Steve could be someone either in India or actually could be non-existent anymore. And so just by the definition of outsourcing and creating that whole of, you know, that contractual surround, 
almost puts that puts that wall in place, which is, and then everyone says, oh, well, you know, the outsourcing company are useless because, you know, I, they're so slow at getting anything done and it, because they used to just tap someone on the shoulder and ask for it to be done. And, and that's the very different thing that you've got to, it, it is the challenge from that side of things. And having been on that side of the fence for, you know, 29, 30 years, it, you know, it gets very tiresome. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one of the things which we actually were um, quite good at in terms of um, running the company was we were used to using tools like this in order to be able to communicate, in order to be able to share, in order to be able to work from home, in order to be able to get things done. So then when it came to having two um, locations, you know, one location was already well on board with how we did this. The other location was got on board with how we did it. We were already talking out to Bulgaria to talk to our, our offshore developers and things like that. So you know, it was, you don't go and just tap them on the shoulder. Um, but we had the ability to just, because we had Slack up as well most of the time, so you'd be you know, having a coffee or available for a chat or actually in a meeting or doing whatever, and you just nip on there, have a quick conversation with somebody, maybe have a, a Zoom call because you actually want to see what they look like today, um, and you know, having a, um, a, a multiple meeting there and you sort your problem out and then on to the next one. So it's really, I think, a, a cultural thing there with regards to the usage of the tools and the acceptance by the rest of the business that these are the tools that you use in order to be able to communicate like this. If they're excluded from the, the process, then suddenly expecting them to come in and you know use all of the IT stuff where from you know now with working from home hopefully everybody's a little, little bit happier with it they know how it all goes even Sam so therefore we should be you know um, much easier getting on that way but the you need to have that um, level playing field where people can use the tool set they can virtually go over and tap somebody on the shoulder you know they just notice you know, they've got some weird um, icon up on Slack. Uh, what does that mean? Having a sandwich. Okay, right. The other one, what does that mean? Oh, he's, he's willing to talk to me. I'll talk to him. You know, what's happening about X, Y, Z, blah, blah, blah. On to the next. Um, I think it's, it really comes down to the culture, which I think you're talking about there. If you've actually got a situation where there is a, uh, to use a technical term, a single API between the consultant and the rest of the business, yeah, then that is your bottleneck. If you haven't got the diverse um, connections into the process that you are engaging with this external, yeah, to help with the process that you've got internally, you're going to get yourself in a mess. Thank you for that, Andy. Really appreciate that. It's a really a, a different thought process, and uh, it's not. And that, listen, you can't. You don't have to agree with all everybody all the time, do you? No, um, Lionel. How are you doing? I just want to bring um, you in. Because, hello. Hello, you're all right. I, yeah. I know, I, th thanks for joining us again. I know you've been on a few of our calls before. Um, I just wonder, because you're currently um, at Sodexo, aren't you? Yeah, I just joined. And um, you're, you're in a, a data role. Um, you're yeah. the head of data and architecture. What, what you know, for you, um, what's been your biggest challenge when it comes to investment in data you know you know yeah. you 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 want to invest in different data analytics tools you want to get people together to you know get that data into one single repository and then be able to report on it and get greater insight what's your challenge been when it comes to investment where you've got a ceo and a cfo kind of battling a little bit so it's it's down to um, their understanding of data and how much they struggle with it on a daily basis. So an example, a previous company, the, the CFO uh, turned out to be also the um, BI manager. Okay. So he was understood how important data was. And so finding the funding for him was fairly easy, right? Because he was in data anyway. Um, Joining Sodexo, it's, it cannot compare because they got rid of all the 
management and pretty much and replaced everybody because it was that bad. But going back to my previous role, um, it was incredibly hard to find any funding because the, the, the CFO just didn't care about IT, didn't care about data. Why? Because he just clicked a button and he had his report that was giving him exactly what he wanted. So he was not interested in going further than that. He was not interested in the running cost of it with a non-premise uh, data warehouse, totally obsolete, that was about to run out of life, literally, because end of product. Um, it was just not interested. And no matter how much effort we put in, we would always have to work around the budget, find some gap somewhere, and put the plaster on the, on the leak. So it's the disconnect between the CFO and the CIO. Uh, and to me, that disconnect was about their use of the data. If they are technology aware, or woke, as the new kids say these days, <laughs> um, they will be a lot more inclined to, to listen to uh, any IT person. If they are an accountant by trade, and that's all they do, technology for them is, is, um, is just a lost, um, there, there was a, a word they used to, to use. Um, it's not a cost center. It's uh, something like that. Like it's just losing money. It doesn't make money at all for them, so they don't care because it's a negative value um, in the balance sheet at the end of the day. So, so that's it's interesting because it, it, I'm say in, in in our context, when you talk about you know people just either interested in a report versus getting into the weeds. Um, our um, our legacy uh, finance group was interested in not transactional level data but the, the next aggregation level above that and that's really where they were getting into at that kind of level and having the data available to to support that kind of more detailed analysis was again part of part of the the work that we did you know over the last few years within our analytics platform uh, rather than just focusing on basic reports which don't tell even half the story well, you were lucky oh. they were interested in aggregations. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The type of people I'm talking about is they would want an Excel spreadsheet and then work from there, mm -hmm. as opposed to having the aggregation done for the whole EMEA done for them to give them a consolidated results. And I think it's down to trust. They didn't trust us to actually provide them with the right aggregation and the right values. So they would spend months and tens of people to, to come up to the same result. Yeah, and, and we had, uh, I completely agree um, that the system that um, the business had prior to two sales ago, I keep going back to how many times this business has been sold, but the, the kind of the analytics platform they had two before this, there was this always this uh, sense that nothing balanced, nothing reconciled to anything. So, you know, part of, part of the big deal on this platform was always ensuring the quality of data, that there was, it was reconciled. Um, you know, to the nth degree, and that you, you, if you ran a report, you could trust that completely and show it to anybody. Uh, you know, and that was always critical to critical to the success of that platform, if nothing else. I, I, I think um, what we've learned this evening, um, even though we've been talking about turnaround scenarios, mergers and acquisitions, we've talked about outsourcing, uh, we've touched on tech projects or products. Um, the big thing seems to be people uh, that, that we keep coming back to people, culture, alignment um, and, and getting people on board and, and managing expectations. And it seems to be if you if you if you get that right, you, you know, you, you're halfway there, aren't you? Yeah, I think what I um, said there, you, you need to build the trust in the CFO. Yeah, he needs to trust the, I, the CIO, the IT is actually contributing to the value of the enterprise in some way. Now, okay, in my instance, that probably came about because um, on occasion something went wrong and Andy had to step in in order to be able to figure out where within the accounting system something had screwed itself away to maybe. Um, and doing that, 
meant that I was resolving an issue for um, the finance department. And as a result, they meant, great, fantastic, you know, money in the bank, credit for next time round. Um, again, we always, we buy things from people, yeah? It doesn't matter what the actual goods are, we end up buying it from people. You've got to actually have the relationship there that means that they know that you're doing things to help them and yeah. therefore contributing towards what their targets are. Yeah. Maybe some of sometimes a bit of a strain, but you know, I think is what we've got to do. So, so CIOs need to be, uh, and, and, you know, leaders of, uh, teams like data architecture, you need to be the best salespeople in the world and psychologists at the same time, uh, understand culture alignment. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, you know, uh, don't forget it's, therapist. And if, well, yeah. Come on, if you can run an IT department, given the fact that you've got in there data scientists, you've got QA guys, you've got support guys, yeah, you've got developers, you've got people who are, um, should we say, agile religious, religious fanatics in there, okay, and you might have people who are still running waterfall, and you're trying to keep all of this together, yeah, you've probably got a qualification in herding cats. So <laughs> therefore... You know, the CFO or whoever alongside that really is just um, almost more of the same. Yeah, I recognize my, CA, my CIO in what you just said there. He comes from um, a DHL background um, and he is more of a CEO than a CIO in his behavior, although he's extremely knowledgeable on the uh, IT bit and technical space things, but the way he runs the department feels to me a lot more like how a CEO would run it, and I think that's why he gets on very well with the CFO um, because they sort of talk the same language when it's necessary. Um, so much so that the um, the CIO is in charge of the business transformation as well as the marketing person. So, so again, having because of somebody, the skills. Yeah, ha having somebody at the at the CEO level who appreciates and understands the challenges and what you're trying to achieve, um, those projects tend to be more successful than others, I guess. Mm. Yeah. Um, just, just, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to finish up in a, in a, in a few minutes because we, we've run over slightly. Nigel, is there anything else that you want to add to the, to the discussion in terms of, you know, um, what organisations really need to, to do to, to deliver successful digital transformation? God, I said it, uh, but, but project products? I, I think you've already said it, Sam, in that, that it's, it's about people. It's about alignment. Um, we've all been involved in those projects that have gone brilliantly well and it had nothing to do with methodology, agile waterfall whatever it was it was just everyone was aligned on getting the outcome and, and pulled towards that um and then we've been all on those projects where we had whatever methodology thrown all over it to death and and it, it went nowhere and it failed and that was because the people weren't really aligned on what its purpose was what it was going to do and committed to making it happen and and, and it's as it's as simple but it's as complex as that uh, and, and that, that really is the single biggest challenge. And, uh, it, you know, I, I believe it makes a difference where a CIO or the leader of a technology uh, organization is positioned organizationally, but equally th there's a place for us to take accountability for whatever happens uh, and, and uh, understand our role, as you say, is, is not about knowing the technology alone. Um, it's a little bit like having an HR director that's an expert in labour law and labour employment law, but um, doesn't do anything about talent and, and leadership. So, uh, yeah, I think you've summed it up really well already. Uh, Andy, uh, last words, what would you like to say? And then I'll come to I, Jonathan. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think that um, it's about making sure that everyone understands the outcomes that you're trying to achieve and is everyone's aligned on those outcomes. The times, it's been, the times when things work most successfully in a lot of the IT space is that if you've got a big critical one major outage, 
everybody is all focused. They do everything they can do in their power to get the system back up and running because they've all got one outcome, which is to actually get the systems back up and running. When you've got projects where the CIO thinks he's got one set of outcomes, CFO's got another, the, um, you know, the, the business think it's another, those projects will all fail. And so aligning at the outcomes level and then measuring your achievement of those outcomes all the way through the development of the product as opposed to just assuming you meet them. And doing that using data, I think, helps. That gets the alignment going right from the word go. I think it's, it's getting on that outcome-based approach to doing things. Excellent. Thanks, Andy. Jonathan, la la last, last words from you, mate. Uh, maybe just on the M&A thing, um, you know, when you're going through it, make sure you've got a plan, communicate that plan to people day one. They'll respect you if you've got that and you're telling them what's going to go on as best you can, um, rather than eight months on really not knowing what's going to happen uh, yet. So, uh, you know, I think, uh, yeah, and we talked a lot about data, but, um, you know, I think M&A space, um, getting, getting the communication right up front with the, with the, new, with the new business, definite is critical jonathan you were talking about your own experiences there you weren't talking about mm -hmm. the government and their handling of the covid crisis were you no 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 not that no the, the <laughs> timing is kind of parallel but no it's my own experience but they, i think i think they're about the same that's my personal opinion because as i say you said you know communicate a plan be strong to execute yeah, it. yeah. nothing yeah. like what's changes, actually at least prove that you've got one yeah 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 <laughs> Um, listen. Um, on that note, um, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to say goodbye. It's been a brilliant evening tonight. Thank you very much indeed for everyone uh, for for uh, being here and taking part. Really, really appreciate it. Um, and um, thank you to our presenters. Thank you to Nigel. Thank you to Andy. Thank you to Jonathan. Um, really, really interesting points of view. Very, very different uh, circumstances but all seems to come around to the same thing. People, 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 people. Um, so listen, thank you very much indeed. Um, I don't know what we've got next week. It's still up in the air. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll let you know. But thank you all for, for being here tonight and um, have a great rest of the evening. Um, and uh, yeah, rule of six, we've got it here, six. We're, we're ticking boxes. Thanks, Sam. Thanks very much, guys. Appreciate Thank you it. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.